خدا محمودی هستم استاد جامعه شناسی در دانشگاه مرلند In my current work I'm, I'm trying to unravel this concept of peace and find a way to bring better understanding about what we need to do to improve our societies, to improve our interaction with one another, etc. And it's not easy because, you know, the program I'm in, the approach it takes to peace is one that is all inclusive. It includes the entire planet and the peoples of this planet. I see so much suffering, so much oppression, so much misery in the world. And I see it in every society. I'm not saying it's only in this part of the world. or that. There are different forms of oppressions, but they're everywhere. And one of the things that I think is so important, especially with students that I come in contact with, is to talk to them about the importance of accepting every human being for who they are. I know they're bad human beings. I know they're human beings that do, that do horrible things. Fine. Uh, but in general, to have this non-discriminatory acceptance of everyone, I think is extremely important. It should be the starting point. I was born in Iran um, and left the country when I was nine years old uh, with my family. Um, my parents were not interested in splitting up the family, and my older brother and sister had come of age where they had to choose a university education, and my parents really wanted them to get the best education, especially their daughters. So they decided that they would relocate. Um, and they tried different parts of the world, because my father, he was a dean of an agricultural college in Iran, and then he had to look for some place where he could have a livelihood somehow to support the family. What came about was he ended up getting uh, accepted to graduate school at Utah State University in Logan, Utah. And so at that point, this was 1959, we were relocated to the United States from Tehran, Iran. So we were very excited. We were very interested in this new opportunity. When we got to Logan, Utah, of course, you can imagine it's a whole different experience. It's a new culture. It's a new world. And um, I have to credit my parents. They told us we are now in a new country, a different culture, and that we have to learn about this environment, this new environment that we're in. And that helped us to really, in a sense, um, explore this culture because we were the only Iranian family in that setting um, and I hardly there was n not another child my age in all of uh, Utah from Iran so you you see the, the the perspective here eventually I received all of my education in this country and uh, went to the university uh, majored in sociology got a PhD in that and then entered the world of academics. Um, from a very young age, I was very curious about learning, all kinds of learning. I mean, I was interested in, I, I, if I told you how many times I wanted to change my major, it would give you an indication of my curiosity. And when I entered academics, I always wanted to know about other fields. I mean, at some point in my life, I really became interested in history and how important history is in relation to uh, giving you a perspective about the past which really uh, informs you better about the present. Um, so I've been in academics most of my life except for 11 years when I was at, um, at the Baha'i World Center in Haifa, Israel in the research department. Beliefs um, as a Baha'i obviously are extremely important 
to me. They've always been important to me. I mean, they are uh, what has guided my life, if, my, if I may put it that way. I guess at the depth of this issue is that my beliefs have um, helped me, actually, to learn my way through the world. Because if I did not have that spiritual connection, I think my life would have been much harder. I know every human being on this planet will suffer. This is no doubt, right? This is, there's no doubt about this. But I think suffering is a part of life, and how one deals with it is extremely important because it can destroy, destroy you if you're not careful, but at the same time you can learn from it. I believe that my Baha'i principles have really helped me to learn how to overcome certain obstacles or tests that were presented to me in my life and will be presented in my life. It's never over until it's over. They have guided me. They have strengthened me, given me an inner strength. I have to be very honest. Uh, and because life can be very lonely. Even if you have family, friends, everything, it can still be very lonely when you uh, want to make sure that ethically and morally you're doing all the correct things, you know. So since 2012, um, I've been um, appointed as the holder of the Baha'i Chair for World Peace at the University of Maryland. The Baha'i Chair is an endowed academic program that um, basically um, takes an interdisciplinary approach to examining the very complex topic of peace. I don't know what peace looks like. I have no clue what a society that is peaceful looks like. I've, I've never seen it, you know. <laughs> so, so to say that the Baha'i Chair knows what peace is would really be presumptuous. But what is really exciting about this work is that we invite scholars from all kinds of fields and disciplines to come and share with us what their research is leading them to find out about many issues. We focus on women, empowerment of women in peace, structural racism, and the root causes of prejudice. We examine climate change and environmental degradation. We look at human nature. Uh, we look at globalization and governance and what is happening in the world as the world becomes a more dangerous, challenging place with uh, uh, governments not quite responding to the challenges quickly enough. We bring these scholars, and it's a learning community, in which we hold uh, lectures, symposia, conferences to explore these topics. And we ask our um, uh, presenters to consider offering solutions. It's interesting because oftentimes academics are marvelous diagnosticians. They're excellent at diagnosing issues. But sometimes it's hard to think about solutions. Um, and it's wonderful to begin this conversation to, to look at solutions because ultimately what the Baha'i Chair would like to do is to Consider policy, consider uh, uh, directions that can be taken in terms of these many challenges. It was actually in Iran that I became conscious of this issue, is the equality of women and men. And I, was, I wasn't conscious as a nine-year-old or a five-year-old of that principle. But I noticed early on the differences between what boys could do and what, what girls could do. I have an older brother, and I remember I really was an active child. I wanted to learn to ride a bicycle. I wanted to um, build things, you know, and all of that. And I noticed when I wanted to ride a bicycle, I always had to be in the street with my brother. As a child, again, I, I wasn't aware of what that meant, but I, I remember my mother always saying, you can't go out there until your brother comes home and is out there with you. And little by little, I became conscious that whereas my brother can go out and do whatever he wants, I have to stay inside 
and then he has to come before I can go out, you know. So, of course, as an adult, I understand this, but, but it was just interesting, you know, in that context. Even when we moved to the United States, um, gradually I became aware that even though, you know, I can go to university and there are opportunities, but, uh, you know, women are not quite treated the same way. I was an undergraduate just as the women's rights movement was beginning to take hold in this country. And I have to say those were very interesting times. It wasn't a perfect movement because it left out many of the minority women, especially the African Americans and all that. But it was nevertheless a consciousness raising movement. And from then on, I decided that I need to be very much aware of this issue. And just as one has to be aware of minority issues in this country, again, I'll focus especially the African American and in California, where I resided for a while, the Hispanic, the Latino population issue. So whether in my teaching or in my academic administrative work, because I became a dean in various places, my goal was to get as many uh, minority students to have access to higher education and to hire faculty of color, faculty from different backgrounds, faculty who are women. Um, so that has been one of my uh, major concentrations in life. Women um, today in, in the contemporary world, I thought that by this time in my life that women would have been uh, further along in terms of their rights, basic human rights, uh, even equal pay for equal work, all of this stuff. But I'm surprised that we've been very slow with this issue. What I see right now in relation to the condition of the world and the women in the world is really quite disturbing. The violence against women has increased in, in all cultures. How shall I put it? The, Cultures who are threatened by women getting educated, I mean, this I didn't think would happen in the 21st century. That you would actually be threatened by a, a, a girl going to school. It, it, this is just really quite something. And I, I think sometimes we um, have to stop and pause and say, what, what is going on? What causes this kind of reaction to a, a human being wanting to get educated. Men, of course, I think, can wipe out the disparities that women feel. They can actually totally achieve equality for women because men are in power. Men are the ones who still are in positions of power. And, and I don't mean that, that um, uh, power is a very uh, hot, word, you know, and I, what I mean by that is it's the men right now who are in positions where they can make a difference. And I think they have a responsibility to, through their actions, their behaviors, their attitudes, their change of mind, to take on this principle and to help other men understand it, but also through their actions show that women and men are really not any different from each other. See, that's the challenge here. If you look at the science and what it's, uh, you know, hormones and neuroscience and all of these research, the, the, the research that's being done about the differences or similarities between men and women, it seems to me that most of them are indicating that in many ways we're similar. The differences are negligible. They're negligible. So it isn't that women cannot do things that men do, but do we want to just bring about uniformity? You know, this is the issue here. Could we just allow a woman to be a woman, a man to be a man, but to have equality and not to always look at them as, you know, this concept of women are from Mars or men are, I can't remember which it is, Venus and Mars. I mean, that is ludicrous. You know, that is just quite ridiculous because 
we are more similar than not. And spiritually, there's absolutely no difference. And so, again, it's a form of prejudice. I think younger women should do their very best to not be impacted by, again, those subtle behaviors as they're growing up in school, in society, in, uh, in the media, that portrays them in roles that are very stereotypic. Um, I would tell young women, you should aim high. You are just as good as any other human being on this planet. And not to settle, not to settle for the ordinary roles that women are put into. Mm -hmm.